the past couple centuries, most technologies that made money more efficient came at the cost of more centralization. Basically, they introduced a, a further degree of centralization in order to add a degree of efficiency to the system. And so, you know, if you go back long enough, people were trading physical gold and silver coins with each other. Then they graduate to banknotes and other types of, of paper instruments where they're still fairly private and they're, they're sound and they're backed, um, but, but they rely on a counterpart to actually have the gold, uh, or at least most of it. Um, and then over time, that naturally results in, in problems where if the underlying is slower and people rarely, rarely want to withdraw it, the people managing those custodians and those banking arrangements are going to realize that. So they're going to say, well, you know, if, if never any more than 40% of people want their gold back at a time, I can, I can lend the other 60% out. Um, and so they can, they can start making more and more claims uh, for the gold and silver than there actually is gold and silver. Um, and the problem is that, you know, back in, in that era, like the free banking era, if banks run into a problem, the claims collapse down towards the underlying, the underlying gold and silver. Uh, and that kept happening enough that they said, okay, let's set up a central bank. All banks will store the reserves in the central bank. The central bank will hold the gold and it has flexibility with the base layer to bail out banks when they need it. And you got to an environment where whenever the number of claims became too high relative to the monetary base, instead of the number of claims collapsing down towards the monetary base, the monetary base would expand to keep most of the claims money good. And so we've, we've entered this structurally more inflationary monetary environment. And that has a number of consequences. One, we talked about earlier about the unit bias of, of contracts and wages. Uh, so in a, in a disinflationary or deflationary environment, we have a very scarce uh, kind of slow growing or no growing money supply. The, the unit bias favors the contract holders and the wage earners uh, because you have a stable unit of account. Whereas if the money supply is constantly inflating and the unit of account is devaluing, it's, it's the onus is generally on those who have to try to keep their get wages uh, increased just to keep up with inflation, let alone to compensate for their greater experience and, and productivity. Um, so that's, that's one factor. Another one is if you exchange gold and silver coins with people or you exchange physical banknotes backed by gold and silver, you can hold them for a pretty long period of time because you don't need interest because they're backed by gold and silver. They're, they're fairly sound. Um, but if you start to have a more inflationary monetary environment, thanks to central banking, um, it's unsafe to hold large amounts of banknotes because they're going to get inflated away if you're not earning interest to keep up. And so you're more inclined to put them in a bank and hold them as, as interest bearing deposits. But that means now that the bank can see everything you do. And by extension, the bank's government can see everything you do. And, and then, you know, um, so we've kind of, we've given up centralization. We've given up the unit of account to a more devaluation one. We've given up a lot of our privacy to, to kind of compensate us for the, the inflation that keeps happening. Um, and then an additional thing is that by having a very flexible monetary base, it allows the easier picking of winners and choosers. So on one, on one hand, whenever you have a government, it's always possible to pick winners and, and losers, but the more, the more, flexibility you have in the monetary base, the easier it is to pick winners and losers. And so, for example, during the um, COVID era, as an example, actually during, during 2008, for example, when the global financial crisis was happening, it was easier for central banks and governments to bail out the, the say, top 25 largest banks than to bail out millions of homeowners. So they build out from this top down, and that's why you got a lot of populism, because they build out the rich people, they didn't bail out the middle class. And then during the, the whole kind of COVID lockdown period, they tried to bail out the, the middle class. They gave them stimulus checks. They gave them child care tax credits, things like that. But when you look at what happened to credit markets, they were able to unfreeze corporate bond markets a lot easier than they could unfreeze distributed bank lending. So large corporations got easier access to credit than small businesses did. And then in addition, when they tried to do the PPP loans, uh, the vast majority of it ended up going to the top 20% of the population. Uh, there were entities like law firms that got half a million dollar PPP loans that didn't need them. And all that turns into grants and just goes to the bottom line of like the top three, like uh, people that run it. And so there's multiple kind of privacy shortcomings, um, wealth concentration shortcomings that all start to accrue when you enter a more flexible and inflationary monetary regime.